Uh, well, let's put that question right now to Richard Tice, leader of Reform UK and, of course, my talk TV colleague. Good morning to you, Richard. Good morning to you, Thank Julia. Thank you very this much. Is a, a, this is more than a challenging question, Julia. I think we have to be completely clear. And let's remind everybody, shall we, that during the leadership campaign of the Tories last summer in 2022, Rishi Sunak said that he viewed China as a national security threat. Yep. And once again, when a Tory MP gets into office, they do a reverse ferret and uh, essentially, all of a sudden, they're just a challenge. Yeah. Well, you'd think it was the other way around, and that someone who, who wasn't in office, wasn't getting those briefings as Prime Minister, would, would be less worried. And then when you see the briefings going, whoa, uh-oh, right, now I'm taking it seriously. But it's the other way around. But this is, this is simply the economic speaking. We are, as we discovered during lockdowns, we are utterly and completely dependent on these global and economic ties. And that's a good thing. I think, you know, countries yeah, look, trading... Uh, no, but countries have having low, low, strong economic ties is a really good thing because it actually does mean countries don't go to war. But the trouble is, this is all one way for us. We are completely reliant on China well, for a huge number of components for virtually everything that we make and, and consume in this country. So we can't stand up to them on any issue. Well, let's be clear. Yes, on a day-to-day -day basis, of course you want economic trading on normal items. But you should not be dependent on them in areas that are, reflect... Uh, an impact on our critical national security or indeed on our critical infrastructure. The idea, for example, that a Chinese billionaire should be the largest donor of our utilities could literally turn the lights off in London. The idea that the Chinese uh, communist regime has been allowed to invest in our nuclear power station that we're building down at Hinkley is utter lunacy. So yes, on a day-to-day -day basis, let's trade with them, let's talk with them, they need to understand that we view them with deep caution, deep, deep caution. Well, because well, we know, well, we, no. we know, look, they want to, the reality is the threat they pose to us is mainly an economic threat. They want to dominate the West economically and make us dependent on them and yes. then gradually, slowly, they economically strangle us. Well, that's, that's this is the thing. Is uh, this is the bit that I find extraordinary. You know that, I know that. I would say that our audience knows that. They know exactly what's going on. They're not doing it out of the goodness of their hearts, are they? This is not a... This is, this is a totalitarian, murderous, tyrannical nation-state run by, frankly, I would say a psychopath. Uh, in, I mean, he's just as bad as Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping. He just doesn't, doesn't play the sort of the Bond baddie figure quite so well in the media. Um, but he, this is a man who is quite happy to imprison people just for saying they'd like to have a chance to vote and to live freely. This is a man who monitors and spies on and punishes people for any dissent whatsoever and has imprisoned the Uyghur people and sent them to re-education camps and mass sterilised people for, um, you know, and, and, and is quite happy, you know, forced women to have abortions if they had too many children. These are not people we want to be friends with. If there is an argument for like having economic ties with this country to try and free them up, mean that they've got economic, you know, wealth, which means that usually you see the case where middle classes turn on these sort of regimes and say, no, no, we want political power too, and you can see some a, a better regime emerging. That would be great. But there's no, there's no sign of that, and the military and domestic and police control that that this government has in China means that that's not going to happen. But the thing here is. Even leaving aside the concerns of the Chinese people, or what they're putting up with, um, the fact that they this this is a deliberate policy by China for world domination, and we're all sleepwalking into it in the West. It's it's utter absurdity, and we need to actually go a bit further, Julia. We need to say, for example, to all our businesses, in the event that China invades Taiwan, then we would impose in the West the same sort of sanctions that have been imposed on Russia, and therefore yeah. British companies need to start diversifying their reliance on supply chains involving China. That is a good thing, so that we reduce our dependency. So yes, let's trade with them. But the madness, the absurdity of what Kemi Badenoch said yesterday, that we need China to help us towards our net zero targets, they cannot believe their luck at our naive stupidity. I mean, they are laughing all the way to bank, selling us electric batteries and selling us wind turbines made with coal-fired powered electricity uh, so that we can virtue signal yeah. uh, in terms of net zero as they steal our jobs and our money. I mean, it is utterly absurd. I've never heard anything quite so stupid. Um, are by you, a government are you surprised to hear it from Kemi Badenoch? 
I'm, I'm astonished, frankly, to hear it from anybody. Well, I'd expect to hear it from Jeremy Hunt. I mean, my God, you know, but 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 Kemi Badenoch, I've always thought was rather sensible. Well, I think she's obviously just exposed herself. Perhaps uh, there's a question mark about that. Maybe she misspoke in the use of sort of <laughs> yes, as we uh, often parliamentary talk about. language. What, what do you, but... talking of parliamentary language, what do you make of the common speaker, Lindsay Hoyle, yesterday telling MPs, don't name this uh, this suspected Chinese spy. He's been named in the Times yesterday and today. Um, uh, they, they, he's issued a statement through his lawyers saying you know, he's innocent, he's a British man who worked in China and was involved in, in, in working for some very senior uh, Tory MPs, one of whom has now gone on to be a security minister, Tom Tugendhat. Um, but but, um, but MPs have been told, don't even raise the issue in the House of Commons. You're going to you know, prejudice any problem in any possible pre legal proceedings or investigations. Do you think it's appropriate for the common speaker to tell MPs what they can and can't talk about? Uh, I don't think that is appropriate. I do think that we should, if the security services and the authorities don't want him named because of an ongoing investigation, because they might be looking at uh, potential accomplices and, th accomplices and things, I think we should respect that. These are often complex, difficult issues. But in terms of not being able to discuss the generalities of the issue and the risks and making people aware, of course Parliament and parliamentarians should be allowed to discuss that. But I think if the security services request the person's name is not discussed, then I think they should respect that. And of course, you know, we, we live in a democracy where actually someone is innocent until proven guilty. The person involved uh, has declared their innocence and so due process will commence and proceed. Indeed. Well, look, let's also ask you about another issue. Look, you know, you've been a, a powerhouse of the of the uh, Brexit campaigns over recent years. Um, uh, we've seen the latest survey by the Immigration Attitudes Tracker Survey. It's showing that two thirds of the public are dissatisfied with the government's approach to immigration. It's the highest level since before the 2016 Brexit referendum vote. We had seen dissatisfaction falling in re in recent years. Obviously, you know, 606,000 net legal migrants, let alone the huge numbers, the tens of thousands of illegal migrants over the Channel arriving. Perhaps there's a put pay to that. But um, are you uh, are you intrigued by the one third of the public who are satisfied with the government approach to immigration? What's extraordinary about these numbers is that, well, first of all, it's two to one. Two people are dissatisfied compared to every one person who is satisfied. Ironically, it's non-Tory voters, it's the Greenies, it's the Lib Dems, it's a few of the Labour voters who are probably satisfied with the idea that mass immigration is a good thing to be welcomed, uh, even though they'd probably never vote Tory in their lives. Um, but that is a bit bizarre. But I think this is a serious wake-up call for the government. That I sh the, the people of Great Britain do not want mass immigration, and that's what they've done. They've literally opened the borders to unlimited, lawful and, frankly, unlawful immigration and they're not doing anything about it. Well, um, my guest Emma Revel, who's a political commentator joining us today, pointed out that actually it may well be the case. Uh, a lot of the people who say they are um, dissatisfied are people who, who think that actually it should be a more open policy. We should have, you know, people from the EU able to travel here freely uh, and we should uh, be you know, offering more uh, routes for refugees and asylum seekers. Essentially, we've already got um, complete open borders. The truth is that 1.2 million people came to live in the United Kingdom uh, in the year to June. Uh, so a lot of their data, they've no idea actually in truth how many people have genuinely left. And then you've got to look at the question of student visas, which is yeah. completely out of control, which has more than trebled in the last three or four years, including lots of dependents. And once you've got a student visa, you can stay here for two years after your degree finishes, and then you will apply for, apply for a skilled worker visa, and you're here forever. This is through a sort of semi-open backdoor, another route towards uh, complete mass immigration into the United Kingdom. And I think the British people uh, are standing up and saying, we don't want this, actually. We want some of our 5.4 million own British citizens who are currently on out-of-work benefits back into work. 